exercised in reference to the possibility of having my eyes restored by divine power. For I knew there was no other source of help. And I tell you, that's an understatement right there. There's no other source. As my faith increased, and notice, I, I, I can't explain this, new eyeballs have been gradually growing and sight increasing, and I can now see sufficiently to distinguish light from darkness, some colors, and the movements of persons. I can see men walking as trees. They appear like tall, tall like trees. My sight is best at twilight, I have reason to believe and hope that my eyesight will be fully restored. And he's, there is another reference in the New Testament where a blind man was partially healed and then fully restored. This is what he's referring to. Now again, I, I cannot explain to you how this can happen other than saying, obviously it's a miracle. Amen. Now interesting enough, John Baylor went to see the eye doctors again, and he actually would do this when he would go to a new town after this event, initial event. I think just to challenge the eye doctor to say, yeah, we have no idea. But notice, this is what he says, lately an oculist examined and investigated my eyes two successive days, and finally reluctantly admitted that in all history, no case had been recorded of a man ever seeing after the eyeballs had been taken out. It must be our conclusion, therefore, that a notable miracle has been done entirely without the aid of human agency. Mm -hmm. To God be all the praise. Mm -hmm. And that's where John F. Baylor gave the praise. Well, January 1893, John F. Baylor moved from Texas to Battle Creek. Right in the midst of the revivals and at the beginning of the General Conference, 1893 General Conference, and he was there. And I don't know, you know, how far and wide his story went, but it wasn't until August 5 that his story was told in Battle Creek, at least publicly, it looks like, because on August 6, um, the Boston Globe picked up the story. And from the Boston, after the Boston Globe picked it up, at least this is what I've been able to find, 23 other newspapers over the next year picked up the story of John F. Baylor. But it only took two weeks for the St. Louis Post to uh, publish a very uh, satire-driven article about John F. May Baylor and mocking the whole idea. Mm -hmm. And that story was also picked up by, I found at least 20 other papers that picked up that story and reprinted it over the next couple of years. It was on November 7, 1893, 18 months after that camp meeting, that John F. F. Baylor's story actually made it into the review. And there are six, eight eyewitness accounts written in the review article by people who knew John F. Baylor before and after and they're testifying, this was a true miracle of God. Amen. And as I, when I ran across this, this story, you know, of course it's like, what is the significance of this story? And I'm going to show you my perspective on it from a, 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 a historical perspective on why this happened, because there's more to the story. It's interesting looking back on this, that on November 6, 1893, one day before John F. Baylor's story came out in the review, another 
a story or article was printed in the Signs of the Times, and it was Ellen White's story about the blind man in John chapter 9. And she uses it to describe the danger of spiritual blindness. And this is just one paragraph from that article. She says, the light of the world was shining amid the moral darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness that blinded the minds of the Pharisees was much more deplorable than was the darkness that blinded the eyes of the man who had been born blind. Mm. But the scribes and the Pharisees became blind by failing to acknowledge the spiritual light that God sent them. Christ left no means untried in order that he might win them. The guilt, the responsibility of their rejection of his mercy lay with themselves. And it's really worth reading this whole article, but the point of it is, is that God is God can more easily heal physical blinding than he can spiritual blindness because he doesn't take our liberty away to, to choose and to push him away. Wow. And I believe this is the, what the story of John F. Baylor teaches us because at this very time, January 1893, even into 1894 and on, the revivals that were taking place during that time had been attributed to fanaticism. Mm. This is just a summary in a book about Prescott. It says, by the time of the student revival at Battle Creek College in December 1892, there was still nonetheless a great deal of alienation among church leaders the revival at the college, which was of dramatic proportions, and resulted in 30 being baptized at the college itself, was labeled as mere excitement by Uriah Smith and others, and this put a dampening effect on the words. And I took all the quotes out from this presentation because I didn't want to keep you too late, but Ellen White even, even wrote about students that when the Holy Spirit would come again onto the campus, they would say, this happened before, but, and, and it was wonderful, but people I trusted and said this was fanaticism, and they would turn away. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, John uh, J. H. Kellogg, John Harvey Kellogg, who the Lord gave great light in regard to medical missionary work, opposed these revivals. Actual, the revivals were actually it sparks students to go out and start working in, the, in their neighborhoods. The very thing that Kellogg was calling for, and yet he, he deemed this, these revivals happening in 1892 and 3 as fanaticism. Well, is it possible, the question could be asked, can we not recognize the Holy Spirit? And you'd be surprised how many statements there are, especially during this time period that it's actually possible to not recognize the latter rain being poured out. Some are looking forward, this was actually 1886 before, uh, before the Minneapolis, some are looking forward to the latter rain to do a work for them that God wants them should do now. They will become so cold they will not recognize the latter rain. Another statement in 1889, uh, those who lived just prior to the second appearing of Christ may expect a large measure of His Holy Spirit which is the latter rain, but if they do not watch and pray, they will go over the same ground of refusing the message of mercy as the Jews did in the time of Christ. And by the way, Ellen White would make that comparison in those four volumes over a hundred times to what was happening then. Well, I'm just going to go through some more, uh, just a timeline here. In 1894, this November or so, there was another article about John F. Baylor uh, and the work he was doing. And it mentions John F. Baylor was in the city for several weeks. His idols are steadily growing and his ability to distinguish objects is better. So still there's progress in his healing. 1895, May is well-known statement. Ellen White came out and said, the Lord in his great mercy sent you know, that most precious message. And that message was to be proclaimed to the world with a loud voice and attended 
uh, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in large measure. That's slattering and loud cry. January 1896, Ellen White writes, these are some of the, probably the, the saddest statements she makes during this time period. God has revealed himself again and again in the most marked manner in Battle Creek. He has given a large measure of his Holy Spirit to believers there. It has come unexpectedly at times, and there have been deep movings upon hearts and minds. And when you read to, about those revivals during those, those years, uh, you know exactly what she's talking about. This blessing extended to large numbers, but why was not this sweet, holy working continued upon hearts and minds? And she gives the answer. Some felt annoyed at this outpouring. And their own natural dispositions were manifested. They said, this is only excitement. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not showers from heaven of the latter rain. Their hearts were full of unbelief. Who did not drink of the Spirit, but had bitterness in their souls. So here you had Ellen White describing what was the beginning of the latter rain. And those saying, this is not. This is only excitement. A few months later, May 1896, Ellen White makes this statement, if the power of Satan can come into the very temple, she's talking about the heart of the word, battle creed, of God, and manipulate things as he pleases, the time of preparation will be prolonged. Here is the secret, notice how she attaches this, here is the secret of the movements made to oppose the men whom God sent with a message of blessing for his people. Why, why, why do you think Satan rose up there in the 1880s and 90s? He knew his time was short. And he wanted to prolong the preparation. The men and God's message were despised as fairly as Christ himself was hated and despised at his first advent. Again, just one of those over a hundred examples. One month later, Ellen White writes this, an unwillingness to yield a preconceived opinion, she's talking about the issue of the law in Galatians, and to accept this truth, that the law was the Ten Commandments pointing us to Christ, lay at the foundation of a large measure of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against Brothers Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people, not completely, but in a great measure, the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world, as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted. That's Revelation 18.1. And by the action of our own brethren has been, in a great degree, kept from the world. National Sunday laws uh, didn't get passed, and it was because A.T. Jones stood up against it. But state laws... They began, the whole movement then went to the states. And they found it more effective to go state by state. And every state in this United States has Sunday blue laws on the books, I believe, except for Montana as the one state that does not. And they began to arrest Sabbath violators. Some were fined, some were imprisoned as early as 1878. But notice where it peaked the arrests, 1896, and then it died away. And my question is, why? This is in a time when, like I said, there was probably, there was around 30,000 church members, and there's probably about 300 Adventists that were arrested, not only in the United States, but other countries, for Sunday law violations. If you were to extrapolate that out to whatever 22 million church members today it's several hundred thousand people you know if you did a ratio that would be being arrested and I tell you there wouldn't be too many people saying we're living close to the very end of time this was going on and yet in 1896 that peaked and then 
died away. 1898, there's another article about John F. Baylor that mentions him, and it says nothing about his eyesight. It just identifies him as working with his wife. 1898, Ellen White had a dream. W.C. White talks about it later, where she saw herself coming up out of a dark place, and her husband turns to her and says, what, have you been there too, Ellen? And she understood this to mean, in 1898, that she would not live to see the second coming. And that changed Ellen White's uh, emphasis, not long after that, to where she began to make many statements about reproducing the works of the past, because she knew there was going to be a delay. And that's where APL's uh, place is today, is reprinting books of the past in fulfillment of what Ellen White was talking about at the turn of the century. 1901, in fact, she said, man cannot possibly stretch over that goal that has been made by workers who have not been following the divine leader. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel, but for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin, she's quoting Isaiah 30, verse 1, by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. And I'm so thankful you brought up in your sermon that thing. This is being expressed today. God's on vacation. When he's done, he'll come in his own time. He's not. Amen. 1909, Brother Baylor is mentioned again in the review, and he's identified as our blind brother. And again in June 29, a couple weeks later, one of our blind agents. He actually became discouraged. His wife died shortly after this. And he kind of strayed away. I think he was just overwhelmed. And then he came back to the Lord. 1915, Ellen White passed away. And on April 1, 1918, John F. Baylor died. And his obituary identifies him as totally. So in light of this, when I see this story, I say, is this not an object lesson to us Amen. today? Just like Ellen White wrote about the blind man being an object lesson to the Pharisees and Sadducees in his first coming. Physical blindness, God can easily heal. But spiritual blindness and a refusal to recognize our past keeps us in a state of lukewarmness. Amen. And I'm not going to even read this quote, but book after book after book published from our publishing houses still to this day claims that the Revivals in 1892 and 1893 were drummed up by A.T. Jones, and we should be thankful they never carried through. It's a lie. It was the latter rain, the beginning. And I'd like to, cl to close with this thought. You know, there's a wall in Jerusalem. They call it the Wailing Wall. And I, I suppose that many people go there with various prayers, but particularly the Orthodox, I have no doubt that in, in their prayers, they're asking Yahweh, when are you going to send the Messiah? Whoa. And although I believe that God hears that 
prayer from probably very sincere people, the only way he can answer that prayer is to say to them somehow, my dear son, I did send the Messiah. 2,000 years ago. And your forefathers hung him on a tree. Mm. And I wonder today, you know, in the Adventist Church, uh, often, especially in times like this, there's a call to get together and pray for the latter rain. Mm. And I think that's a good thing to do. But I wonder if sometimes when we pray, maybe either in ignorance or we pray in staunch opposition, Lord, send us the latter rain. If God's hands are not tied in a similar way, how can He send the latter rain or the beginning of the latter rain again? If we fail to acknowledge that our forefathers were part of a event that pushed that beginning of the latter rain away. Amen. And John F. Baylor's life and death to me is an allegory of that very thing. The latter rain isn't some single event that just, you know, darkness, bright light. It's like the day dawn. Begins brighter and brighter until the noon daylight. And John F. Baylor's eyesight came, began to grow brighter and brighter, and then he went out, it went out in darkness. Just like I believe what God intended with the Holy Spirit outpouring happened in the 1890s. Has God left this church? No. There's no eighth church. There's only the seventh, the latest in church. But you and I are part of this church that today, this can be a generation who says, as we pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord, forgive me and forgive my fathers for what we have done to you. Amen. Go back and read what Daniel prayed. Amen. In his prayer. Corporate. That was a corporate prayer. Corporate. John the Baptist, John the Baptist's father was in the process of praying corporately. Desire of Ages talks about this for the sins of Israel. When an angel came up and said, I've answered your prayer, you're going to have a son. I don't think John was praying for a son. They were beyond the age. He was praying for the sins of Israel. And God said, I'll bring you the Son, and He'll prepare the way for the Messiah. Amen. 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 So let me close with this quote from uh, education. You've, we've all read this. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. Few think of it in relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but notice that suffering didn't begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God every departure from right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach His ideal brings grief to Him. I mean, we, we have a hard enough time dealing with our own grief. Can you imagine how many billion on this planet that God is dealing with every day? Our world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery that we dare not allow even our thoughts to dwell upon. I mean, there's times when I can't, I just stay away from the news for several days because I can't. I mean, I, I want to know where we're at as a country, but there's sometimes I just, it's too much. In order to destroy sin and its results, he gave his best beloved, and he has put it in our power, not our innate power, but our power through choice, through cooperation 
with him to bring this scene of misery to an end. Amen. And you know, again, Raymond, one of Raymond's favorite topics was this idea of repentance, corporate repentance, and just the latest scene message. We would talk about it so many times, and I'm sure he talked about it here and in other places, you know, the people that he's been connected with. And now Raymond is waiting with all the others. And they're waiting on us. Amen. And you know, I, I, I can see the problems in our church. But so often I'm blind to that beam, you know, that's in my eyes. Amen. And I just want to pray, you know, that the Lord would give us that eyesight. Give me, Ron Duffield, that eyesight that he is freely offering us Amen. today. Amen. That we would discern our nothingness in the way it is. And discern his greatness. Amen. That we would put on that robe of righteousness. There's not one thread human devising. And to have that faith of Jesus. Amen. Glory. So let's pray tonight as we close. Father, we thank you for this day, a high Sabbath day, to rejoice in your goodness, Lord, even though we've lost a brother. Someday, Lord, we'll know why the timing Perhaps it was to get us to think more deeply about your soon return. But Lord, we want to all be there. We want to be there on that resurrection morning. And we want to tell everybody, mm -hmm. Jesus was faithful. Mm -hmm. Lord, may we all be there. Lord, forgive us mm -hmm. as individuals. Forgive us as a people. And may the story of John F. Baylor remind us, Lord, that you longed to pour out your Holy Spirit, but we, as a people long ago, and continued since then, have pushed him away. Lord, this, may this be the generation that says, yes, Lord Jesus, we will take you, we will take your message. Please use us and transform us and make us a difference to those around us. Lord, we pray this all. In the name of Jesus, and we ask a blessing on each family here represented. Amen. 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 Thanks, Lord. I forgot to turn on the timer, so I don't even know how long I've been. It's all right. It was just it was perfect. Vicki, you want to close us out with a song and we can all stand and uh, you know, yeah. go with our, our marching orders?